everyone. Thanks for your patience. We just had a few people arriving late, so we wanted to make sure they had a chance to get in. My name is David Leinster, and I'm the CEO of Contemporary Calgary, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to Beauty and the Brain, which by its title you will know is most certainly not about me. Um, we're here tonight in the historical planetarium, but let's first ground ourselves that we're guests on this land. I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that we're gathered on the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. This includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Bagani, and Gainai First Nations, the Satina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And as we always do at Contemporary Calgary, we acknowledge that we're also situated just steps away from the Bow River and that the traditional Blackfoot name of the place where the bow and the elbow meet is Mohinstis, which we also call the City of Calgary. Tonight's talk is part of the Everywhere We Are exhibition, a two-part exhibition that is co-curated by Contemporary Calgary and the University of Calgary Nickel Galleries. Before I welcome Dick Aberns to the stage to share a few words and to introduce Dr. Ocean Vartarian, I would like to thank the people, patrons, and organizations that make this exhibition and its public programs possible. Everywhere We Are is presented by Peter and Jan Terzakian. Thank you for being here with us tonight, Jan. It's supported by Chubb Insurance, Company of Canada, and Lloyd Sad Novacord. We're also grateful for exhibition benefactors, Michael and Renee Timms, and exhibitions patrons, Karen Radford and Jason Grilowski, Sharon Martins, and Aaron Thrall and Peter Johnson. Thanks also for being here tonight. And of course, we're supported by our friends at the City of Calgary, Calgary Arts Development, the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, and the Canada Council. There are five incredible exhibitions on right now at Contemporary Calgary. It's the most full the gallery has been since we opened, and I invite you all to experience them while you're here tonight, or better yet, get a membership for $20, and you can come as often as you like. We'd like people to think about a membership at Contemporary Calgary is like having a card to the library, a place where you can come often to be inspired and to connect. One of the exhibitions in the gallery is Perspectives from Within, which is a major group exhibition featuring visual artwork critically engaging with mental health produced by OBAD or the Organization for Bipolar Affective Disorders. We thought it would only be fitting to invite Dick Averns, the exhibition's curator, to say a few words and to formally introduce tonight's speaker. Dick is curatorial coordinator with the University of Calgary Founders Gallery and works closely with the Nickel Galleries. An independent artist and curator, he has a long-standing interest in and commitment to art and mental wellness. And in 2020, he received the Mayor's Leadership Award for Healing Through the Arts. Thanks so much for being here with us tonight, and please welcome Dick Averns. Thank you very much, uh, David. So one housekeeping item before I give my introduction, cell phones, pages, buzzers, if you can put them on mute or uh, turn them off, that will make sure we have a uh, evening that is free of unwanted distractions, other than of course, our main event. Beauty and the brain, what could this possibly entail? With research specialties in perception, cognition, and cognitive neuroscience, Dr. Ocean Vartanian won't just be talking about beauty in the brain, he'll be unpacking his research into the science of aesthetics. Ocean's career stems from his curiosity about the scientific basis for creativity, from which his primary area of research involves the psychology and neuroscience of creativity. But simply, what is it that drives the generation of novelty in the sciences and the arts? In this sense, aesthetic appreciation can be seen as the flip side of the coin. How is it that people appreciate the products and processes of creativity, be they paintings, music, literature, and so forth? Ocean received his PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Maine, and his career trajectory then saw him undertake a postdoc at York University in the early 2000s a key time in that this is when the field of brain imaging really became a mature technology. The use of fMRI technology or functional magnetic resonance imaging to study how the brain responds to the experience of viewing artworks 
became Ocean's focus. And although the discipline itself of empirical aesthetics, that is, as he reminds me, the studying of aesthetics scientifically, and that this dates back to the 19th century, Ocean pointed out kindly to me earlier today, it's only really very recently that the effects of technology and the study on the brain are happening in vivo, that is, with the biology of living organisms ourselves, in this instance as humans, with our brains interacting live with artworks. But of course, looking at the data is only one level in terms of the brain and is one window into the process. In this regard, I encourage you to be ready for Ocean to tell us more about the importance of brain interaction with art on a social and contextual level. And with the online research gate indicating he has 123 published works amassing 3,549 citations, I think he knows his stuff. Of course, his visit is extremely timely, as David mentioned, the rich exhibitions currently on display here at Contemporary Calgary, the study of form, the beauty of aesthetics and paint in its own right, contextual topics, feminism to mental health and to gender and diversity, what better time could we all be getting together today? Not just an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto, but clearly an expert on neuroscience and aesthetics. Prepare your synapses to, uh, synapses to be titillated and welcome Dr. Ocean Vartanian. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, David and Jake, for that very, very kind introduction. I'm really humbled to be here. I also love the space that we're in. It's absolutely fantastic. As I was telling Ken last night, um, a lot of my recent work has sort of involved the uh, aesthetic appreciation that we get out of the architectural design features of the environment that we're in. So I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, before I start, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Contemporary Calgary, of course, Nickel Galleries, and a very long host of people who've been extremely kind uh, hosting this event and organizing everything, particularly Ken and Michelle, who've been very kind, and uh, also uh, University of Calgary for having me here for uh, tonight. Um, I've been about, I have about 45 minutes for this presentation. I tend to sometimes go a little over, uh, but I'm gonna try and kind of keep to the time limit tonight. It's still much better than what we typically get at various kinds of meetings that we go to, where we're kind of like limited to about 12 minutes or so for presentations. Um, so my talk tonight is about the neurobiology and psychology of aesthetic appreciation. Uh, what I really hope to do tonight is, you know, this talk could not have been given uh, 20 or 25 years ago. It's really a new thing because it's only really about maybe 20 or 25 years at which point we've had the technology that we need to probe the brain in ways that was not really possible before. So people like me who were sort of going through graduate school at the turn of the century were sort of lucky because we came out of graduate school and suddenly a whole host of technologies were available out there for us to use to test hypotheses that we'd learned about in graduate school but couldn't really test directly, okay? Uh, the field, uh, as it's currently stated, it's called neuroaesthetics. I'm going to try and unpack that for you. I also would wish to show you that some of the roots of this field are actually very old, going back all the way to the 19th century. In some ways, a lot of the questions that we're asking now are the same things that have been asked for well over 100 years, but we have a particularly new angle to look at them and to test them. The second thing I would like to talk about is this model that Anjan Chatterjee and I introduced a few years ago called the aesthetic triad. So I've been doing work in this area for about 20 to 25 years, and he and I reviewed the entire literature that's sort of available out there that has investigated the neuroscience and psychology of aesthetic appreciation. And we were able to see very interesting regularities in the kind of data that are kind of coming out of this area of research. And it looks like there are three major systems in the brain that underlie three particular kinds of processes that together interact to bring about an aesthetic experience. And those three systems, as you can see, are the emotion valuation system. So this is basically a very old system in the brain that processes rewards, okay? Regardless of whether it's the taste of chocolate, the scent of wine, enjoyment of sex, or pleasure from artwork. It's a very old evolutionary system that's sort of common to all of these processes. The second system is the sensory motor system. So this is sort of the one that actually allows you to empathize with the content of an artwork from a perceptual perspective, okay? 
And the third one, which I find in some ways is the most interesting one, are all of these large scale conceptual, contextual, social features that come into play that color your experience and can drive your preferences. So each of these different kinds of input are processed in different parts of the brain. Uh, we no longer really talk about specific structures in the brain. We have these large scale systems that are kind of co-activated to achieve different kinds of past goals. And I'm gonna try and unpack this literature for you. After I have done that, I want to move beyond pleasure and beauty, because a lot of this work, I'd say for the last maybe 150 years, has really involved the study of very simple pleasures. For example, a person would come into a lab, the person is shown a particular kind of artwork, you collect some kind of a liking response from them. But we know that we tend to have aesthetic experiences that are very profound and intense, and they can involve even the engagement of negative emotions, for example, watching horror and so forth. So our field has really kind of now extended beyond its initial narrow scope to kind of study what I call our complex pleasures, okay? And I finally want to end with uh, some outstanding questions. Uh, you know, I, um, the, what I get mostly myself out of giving talks is to get feedback from you because I'm always very much looking forward to the ideas that you might have to move this research in more interesting directions. So after I've talked about the outstanding questions on the back end, if there's sort of things that came to mind for you that you thought were clearly things that one should look at further, I'd be very happy to hear about them. Okay, I want to deal with this upfront. So uh, um, because I'm a brain imaging person, I collect most of my data in the fMRI scanner. Okay, so if you're a person really interested in the arts, as I am myself, the first question you want to ask yourself is, is this an ecologically valid environment for understanding what happens in the brain when a person is interacting with an artwork? And I think it's a very legitimate question. Okay, and what I want to tell you is that the, the um, best way to look at these data is to kind of think of this one slice of the picture. So people who are using brain imaging technology to understand the neuroscience of aesthetic experience, at least all the people whom I know and respect, do not really consider the biology to be in any shape or form fundamental to everything else. So you can sort of think about this in terms of different channels of information that you can get information out of that you then want to kind of put together to understand aesthetic experience as a higher order function. Okay, when a person goes into the fMRI scanner, they're still influenced by all kinds of contextual factors, all kinds of social factors, huge amounts of individual differences come into play when you're analyzing fMRI data. So even though most of what I'll be showing you today will involve images of blobs on brain slides that I'm going to try and unpack for you, it's important to remember that it's only one part of the overall picture, okay? It's not everything. Now, for this particular talk, I'm not going to assume that you have deep knowledge of neuroscience or brain imaging, but I do want to give you a one-minute breakdown of the fMRI signal, okay? So the way to think about this is you've got a brain that has different areas of specialization. And when a particular part of the brain is demanded for doing a particular kind of task, there is increased blood flow to that particular part of the brain to supply it with oxygen. Why is oxygen needed? Because that kind of tends to meet the metabolic demands of the brain. So say you are looking at something, when you're looking at something, your visual cortex has to work harder. This increased blood flow to the visual cortex as a function thereof. Once the blood arrives at the location, there's transfer of oxygen from the blood to the brain and back. And when that transfer happens, there's a change in the magnetic field. And this is what the fMRI signal detects. Okay, so that's a one minute breakdown of fMRI technology. Now, um, fMRI technology is entirely correlational. So nothing I'll talk about today, except a couple of specific techniques are, uh, can show you anything about what's happening from a causal perspective. So all fMRI data are by definition correlational. So what we then tend to do is we pair them up with different kinds of lab studies and patient studies to test causal hypotheses, okay? Okay, so what is neuroaesthetics? So neuroaesthetics is the neuroscientific study of what happens in the brain when a person is engaged in aesthetic appreciation, okay? Of course, the next thing you want to ask yourself is, what is an aesthetic experience, okay? And it turns out that this is not a very easy thing to define, and I don't think there's really very solid consensus within the field as to what constitutes an aesthetic experience. 
But the way I've defined it here is what most people would agree with, which is it's some kind of an appraisal or evaluation of a particular object or an outcome on a dimension that ranges from good or bad. So for example, if you taste a glass of wine and you have an opinion about how good you find a glass of wine to be, if you are engaged in conversation and you have an opinion about the quality of the uh, goodness of that conversation, when you, have, when you view a work of art and you have a sense of how beautiful that artwork might be, these are all various examples of aesthetic experiences. In other words, aesthetic experiences are not in any shape or form limited to art. They extend far beyond art. For example, one of the areas of study in our lab is we do a lot of work in facial attractiveness. Okay, the extent to which you look at different kinds of faces, the extent to which you may or may not find them attractive, and how this engages various kinds of decisions about those faces. All of that falls within the domain of aesthetics, even though it's not, it's not necessarily artwork. However, it is true that when you survey people, um, and many have been done, I've got one um, citation here from my good friend Thomas Jakobsen from 2004, but there are many others out there. When you ask people to list what comes to mind when they think about the term aesthetics, beauty comes up very, very often. So typically in 90% or more of the cases, when people think about aesthetics, the term beauty comes up almost automatically, okay? And as you might think, beauty is also not very easy to define. So in a, lot of the, in a lot of the studies that we do when we're gauging aesthetic appreciation, we ask people's preferences for various kinds of phenomena. For example, it could be a piece of music, it could be a visual artwork that they're looking at, it could be a face. And there are different kinds of ways in which you can elicit an aesthetic evaluation. You can ask the person about how much they like it, how attractive they find it to be, how moving it is, how beautiful it is. All of these are different examples of eliciting aesthetic judgments. And of course, the computational underpinnings of those questions are slightly different. So we know, for example, that to be able to experience beauty, it's almost a necessary prerequisite for that to be accompanied by a sense of pleasure. Okay. We also know that judging something as beautiful requires more cognitive effort than judging something in terms of whether you like it or not. The reason for that is, if you want to judge something as to whether it's beautiful or not, not only do you have to generate a liking signal, but you have to compare it to some kind of a template that you have in your own mind as to what it is that constitutes beauty. So it's also a template matching um, step involved. And this is why we did this review of the literature. Um, it's a very nice paper uh, um, that, that was um, authored by uh, Marcus Pierce and colleagues, where we kind of mapped these different areas in terms of a useful Venn diagram. So you can see that there is the cognitive neuroscience of aesthetics, and that's primarily what I'll be talking about today, and that overlaps with an area of study called the cognitive uh, neuroscience of the arts. Okay, Of course, arts, artistic experiences extend beyond aesthetics. Okay, but well, there's definitely an overlap there. And within there is the scientific study of beauty. And beauty is a very special kind of concept to study because it tends to have major areas of overlap with both aesthetics and the arts. So when I talk about different kinds of studies today, I'll let you know in advance what the specific thing was that was elicited in the form of that study. Okay, so as you can see, uh, there's a lot of growth in this area. This is basically a PubMed chart that I printed out a couple of days ago in terms of the number of studies that have been published on the topic of neuroaesthetics just going back a few years ago. So it clearly seems to be a growing field. But the father of this area really is the father of experimental psychology. Uh, any person in this audience who took a class in sensation and perception would have certainly heard about Gustav Theodor Fechner. So um, he wrote this very foundational book uh, called Vorschule der Ästhetik, which in German translates roughly into preschool for aesthetics that was published in 1876. This is sort of the Bible of the field. Okay, This was a foundational text because he was a physicist and a philosopher and a psychologist and a very deep thinker. And he kind of wanted to put the field of aesthetics on a scientific footing. And he wrote this absolutely wonderful book that's just only recently been translated in its entirety into English, in which you kind of set out the framework and the major questions and research methods for addressing aesthetics from a scientific perspective. 
this particular uh, chapter is a very important one in the book because there's a couple of different ways in which one can study aesthetics. So when he was writing this book back in 1876, a lot of the people dealing with aesthetics were philosophers. Okay, and their approach to studying aesthetics is what Fechner called from above. So they were mostly using introspective methods to think about the nature of aesthetics. He argued in turn that the proper way to study aesthetics is to study it from below, von unten. Yeah, so in other words, what you want to do is you want to look at art as a stimulus category. You want to measure various kinds of physical features of that particular stimulus and see the impact that it has on the human perceptual and cognitive systems. So as opposed to having a top-down approach that's philosophically oriented, you go to the artwork and you build up from there. And this had inc incredible amounts of impact and continues to have on the way we think about this field. But I want to say this up front because this was basically a valid way to look at the work back in 1876. But now we know that the um, aesthetic appreciation as it happens in an actual environment is influenced by loads of contextual, social, cultural, and individual differences factors. So studying it from under now also has to be accompanied by studying it from above. So it's really a bi-directional system that I'm going to make an argument for. Okay, now um, he was a psychophysicist, and of course, if you are a psychophysicist, your primary area of interest is trying to understand lawful relationships between different kinds of physical features of the stimulus and the way in which those are experienced by the human interacting with them. So he's really well known uh, for this uh, Weber Fechner law. Uh, this very simple diagram is a very important diagram because it shows the relationship between the actual intensity of a particular stimulus, for example, that could be the intensity of sound through the auditory channel or the brightness of a patch of color that you're looking at through the visual channel, and the way in which differences in that particular intensity levels are detected and experienced by the person. And it was able to show that there's actually a lawful relationship between variations in the experience that one has about those stimulus features and the actual levels of that intensity of the stimulus. This is a really important finding because it links the physical features of the stimulus to the psychological experiences related to those stimuli. And he introduced an important distinction called what he, between what he called outer psychophysics and inner psychophysics. So everything that I've talked about so far having to do with the link between the stimulus and perception is outer psychophysics. Okay, so you modulate level of the stimulus, for example, the brightness of the light, and you measure how well the person can detect differences from a psychological perspective. But he also knew that there is an intermediate level there, which is what he called inner psychophysics. Okay, and that would be the role that the brain plays in relaying information from variations in the stimulus to what's actually experienced perceptually. Now, he was aware of inner psychophysics, but back in 1876, there was actually no way to study this empirically. And this is the main difference between his version and what we call modern psychophysics, because now we actually have a way to look at neural activity, which is the mediator between differences in a stimulus level and what the person experiences psychologically. So, I wanted to take you on this historical tour, not only because Fechner is a big hero of everyone who studies aesthetic appreciation, but to also show you that some of the basic questions that, that I'm going to be talking about today have their roots in very old classical thinking dating all the way back to 1876 and probably even earlier. Okay. Another issue that I want to deal with early on is this issue of individual differences. So every time I talk with my colleagues about the fact that I'm studying aesthetic appreciation, the very first thing that will come to mind is, you know what, people's tastes in art differ. They're, they're going to be completely idiosyncratic, there'll be no regularity in the kind of measures that you collect from people. How can you possibly study something that is so idiosyncratic in nature along the lines of individual differences in taste, okay? so. It is true that there are lots of individual differences in taste, but it's also true that the responses that you get from people are not random. So 
This is a very interesting study that was done by Ed Vessel that was published in Cognition just a few years ago, where this is exactly what he was trying to get at. He was trying to see whether there are particular kinds of stimulus categories for which you're going to see more agreement amongst people compared to other stimulus categories. And he essentially had two different kinds of st stimulus categories in his study. Category one consisted of faces and scenes. So these are kind of biological stimuli, okay? They're not man-made, they're biological, about which we can have an aesthetic judgment. So I do lots of work in which I show people pictures of scenes and I collect aesthetic judgments about how much they like those scenes and what factors within those scenes predict judgment. You can also do the same thing with faces, okay? But interestingly, he also included human artifacts in the form of architecture and visual art, okay? And the hypothesis here was that you're gonna probably see variation in people's judgment in terms of what they find beautiful across these different stimulus categories, but that the variation may not be the same across all five categories. Now, for this particular study, what Ed actually probed wasn't beauty, but moving. So he has a long history of research in this area where he asks, where he asks people, how moving do you find this image to be as a proxy for aesthetic judgment? And these are the results that he found. So what you see on the x-axis is the degree of agreement that you see in judgment amongst people judging all of these different stimuli. And what you see on the x-axis are the different stimulus categories. So what you see on the left side, you can see that when it comes to faces and scenes, there is a lot of agreement amongst people in terms of what they find moving, okay? Probably because these stimulus categories actually involve a lot of biological signals that are shared amongst us. Okay? So we're driven by the same signals and therefore our judgments are very similar. Now, if you see compared to faces and scenes, there is a lot less agreement when you look at human artifacts like architecture and art. And of course, that's because our preferences for things having to do with architecture, design and art are very heavily influenced by social factors, cultural factors, individual differences, and context, okay? But importantly, there is agreement, okay? So lots of studies have been done going back to at least the 1970s that have shown reliably that you can generate very consistent aesthetic ratings for different kinds of stimulus categories within visual art. They're not gonna be as consistent in agreement terms as what you'd find for naturally occurring stimuli, but they're certainly consistent and reliable enough to offer an opportunity for scientific study, okay? Okay, so now let's get into the meat of the talk, okay? So as you remember, um, I mentioned how there are essentially three different systems in the brain that uh, Angela and I have argued can really um, allow you to study the emergence of aesthetic experience um, in the mind. And the first one has to do with emotion valuation, okay? So this is a very old study that we did back in 2004. Uh, actually, 2004 is kind of an important year because that's the year within which all of the very first fMRI studies of visual aesthetics actually appeared, having to do with paintings. So we had a very simple design. We had people go into the fMRI scanner. They were shown a whole bunch of different uh, artworks, either abstract or representational in randomized order. And their task was very simple. Every time you see an artwork, press a button that indicates how much you like it, okay? And what we found is we found activation in caudate nucleus and the uh, cingulate sulcus. These are the images that you see on the left and the middle portion. These are core regions of the brain's reward system. Okay, so for example, people who suffer from anhedonia and have difficulty experiencing pleasure have underactive um, caudate nucleus and cingulate sulcus. So these areas are old regions within the brain system that are very sensitive to how rewarding you find something to be. We also find activation on the right-hand side in the, in the back of the brain, in occipital lobes that process vision. Now, at the time we thought that's probably happening because people are looking at visual stimuli, but we now know now that the visual cortex not only, of course, detects what you see, but it's also involved in a computation of preferences for what you're looking at. All right, we didn't notice back in 2004, that's something that, that we've since discovered. 
In the same month, another very nice paper appeared that's been incredibly influential. That was uh, done, it was a study done at the University College London, where some fantastic work has been done in this area by Samir Zeki, who's a very well known visual neuroscientist. A very similar design to our study he had people go into the fMRI scanner, they were shown different kinds of paintings that were categorized as either beautiful, ugly, or neutral. Okay, and he did some very basic categorical contrast in the brain to see when a person is rating a particular painting as beautiful, where do you see activation? And the area that I've circled there will be very familiar to anyone doing work in cognitive neuroscience. It's the orbital frontal cortex. It's kind of the quintessential human area for computing reward. Okay, so it comes online when you're looking at a face and you're telling me how beautiful you find that face to be. It comes online when you're looking at a piece of music and you're telling me how movie that piece of music is. And also, of course, when you look at a piece of um, art, and you're telling me how beautiful you find that to be. Okay, again, a core region within the brain's reward system. Okay, now we know that when people go into the museum, it's a special environment. Okay, so our vision is not really necessarily in tuned to be in an aesthetic mode as its default mode. What's vision primarily used for? It's used for navigation, recognition, and kind of figuring out what's happening in your environment. That's what we call the pragmatic orientation. So the pragmatic orientation of vision, which is your default orientation, is to recognize objects, identify things, and navigate the environment. Okay, the aesthetic orientation is a special kind of orientation that you assume when you're interacting with works of art. So this really good uh, colleague of mine, uh, Jerry Kupchik, who's a professor at U of T, who's done work in this area for a very, very long time. He and I did this study um, back in 2000, where we, kind of, where we had people go into the fMRI scanner. And again, they looked at different kinds of paintings under different viewing conditions. In the pragmatic viewing orientation, you can see what the instructions look like. We specifically primed them to look at paintings, but to engage in object recognition. Okay, what you would normally do when you're looking at scenes and objects. Whereas in the aesthetic orientation, we actually ask them to orient themselves towards the images as if they were in a museum context. Okay, so to pay attention to colors, tones, compositions, and what they feel as they're viewing paintings. Okay, and what we're able to show is when you are comparing what's happening in the brain when a person is looking at the same artworks, aesthetically compared to pragmatically is you get increased activation in this region of the brain called the anterior insula so the anterior insula is another very interesting and old region of the brain that's involved in processing emotions the historical view of the insula used to be that it was involved in processing primarily visceral negative emotions so for example painful stimuli things that seemed threatening but now we know that it's much more generalized and it's engaged in processing emotion along the entire spectrum from things that are completely unpleasant to things that are completely pleasant so interestingly when you're assuming an aesthetic orientation where your task is to really interact with works of art emotively okay this region of the brain that's encoding emotion comes online yeah so we were super excited to see this result so uh, a couple of years went by and it was an absolute explosion of studies in this area um, looking at similar issues. So what you can do uh, with fMRI data as you can do with behavioral data in psychology is you can do what are referred to as meta-analyses. So what's a meta-analysis? In a meta-analysis, you combine data from a whole bunch of different studies and you try and look for regular patterns of activation because there's probably going to be lots of idiosyncratic things that are going to distinguish one study from another. The people are different, the tasks are different, the measures are different, all kinds of contextual differences. A meta-analysis allows you quantitatively to show what's consistent across all of these studies regardless of those differences. So again, what we found in a meta-analysis where we did all of the painting studies, all the fMRI studies that have looked at paintings, is we were able to show that you see activation in the back of the brain, that's the visual cortex. Of course, that's not surprising because what people are looking at is actually visual in nature. We saw activation in regions of the temporal lobe that are sensitive to specific kinds of things people look at. So for example, in the temporal lobes, we've got this really interesting area called the fusiform face area. And when you look at a face, it lights up. So we found that this is also true for paintings because a lot of the paintings that people look at have 
images of faces in them. There's another really interesting area called the parahippocampal place area that's very sensitive and it comes online when people are looking at a place or a scene. That's also not surprising because a lot of the paintings that people looked at across these studies were representational pictures of scenes. But the two areas that I've highlighted there, again, remember the anterior insula, so the one that's encoding emotion. Across all of these different studies, it came up consistently. So emotion seems to be an important factor. And the putamen is another really old brain region that is sensitive to the reward value that you attach to things. So when you evaluate something in terms of how much you like it, how much you value it, it comes online. So regardless of differences across studies, emotion valuation was important. Uh, the same thing happened in a different meta-analysis that included not only paintings, but also sculptures. Then there was another meta-analysis that was done that not only looked at paintings and sculptures, but also faces, erotic images, all kinds of studies in which people are shown different kinds of visual images and are telling you how much they like them. And you see a very consistent set of activations that engage the visual system and various kinds of nodes within the emotion reward pathway. So this shows you that when you are interacting with visual stimuli, in particular artwork, and you're telling me something about how much you like them, emotion and reward play important roles in that. This again is a generalized meta-analysis of the reward pathways in the brain. It, it overlaps almost perfectly with the ones that encode emotion. Why is that? It's because objects that we find rewarding offer us effective cues. Okay, So things that we like, we also tend to want to pursue. Okay, So there's a very close linkage between reward and emotion, which is the reason why a lot of these areas that code for reward also come online when you're studying emotion pathways. And this generates what's a very interesting uh, phenomenon called the pleasure cycle. So I borrowed this really nice image from a paper that was published by a good friend of mine, Martin Scove, a couple of years ago. I really highly recommend that you read this paper. It, it was published in Empirical Studies of the Arts. So I want, you, I want to walk you through this image um, going from the left to the right. So what you see on the X, on the Y axis is the, is the amount of pleasure a person experiences. So what you have early on in the pleasure cycle is a feeling of desire. So wanting is paramount. So in neuroscience, we know that there's a really big difference between wanting versus liking, even though typically when naive people think about these two phenomena, because they tend to go hand in hand very often, you tend not to distinguish between them. But wanting and liking, not only are they dissociable in the brain, they also have different kinds of motivational properties. So early on in the phase of the pleasure cycle, you have an increase in desire, which leads to an increase in arousal. Okay, and this is when one thing is paramount and you engage in approach behavior. Okay, and then what you've got in the middle phase is when the actual rewarding stimulus is consumed. This is the liking phase. Okay, so you have a desire phase that motivates approaching behavior, then there is interacting with the object that can generate high levels of pleasure. Okay. And afterwards, what happens is you go through this final phase in the back end, which is a learning phase. And a learning phase is very important because when you are interacting with a particular object, and that could be an artwork, you go into the interaction with an expectation. Okay? And the expectation, for example, could be how rewarding that experience will be. This, of course, is also true for consuming food, consuming drink, sexual behavior. All of these have a very similar cycles such as this one. So you have approach behavior followed by consummation, and then that's followed by a reflection about what's happened. And of course, if your expectations are satisfied, there's essentially not much to learn. But if your expectations were dissatisfied, there's a gap between what actually was predicted and what occurred, and that's an opportunity for learning. Okay, so even though you're interacting with an artwork, there's actually a functional aspect to this interaction because it can lead to learning. Okay, so one thing I want to have you take away from what I've talked about so far is a lot of support for what's referred to as the common currency hypothesis. This idea that in terms of emotion and reward, our interactions with artwork 
are driven by, in a, in a large way, by a really common emotional reward mechanism that's common to lots of different object categories. So I've listed some up there. This is not to say that drinking a wonderful glass of red wine is the same thing as appreciating a work of visual art. Okay? So it's important to have that clarity. What this really means is that from an evolutionary perspective, it makes no sense for the brain to have evolved specific modules for computing reward for all of these different categories of stimuli. What makes much more sense is that there be a common system that's shared by all of these different categories that are then, of course, further specialized because of many other cognitive factors that come in to kind of contextualize what the person's experience is. Okay, but from an underlying reward mechanism pathway, there's a lot of uh, similarity here. Okay, how about the second system? Sensory motor. Okay, I always like to put this image up because every time I look at this image, it's such a visceral image to look at. Okay, um, and you don't necessarily have to be of a particular religious orientation to feel that. So this is that moment when uh, the skeptic uh, Thomas is putting his finger into the torso of Christ to verify that the story that he's heard about the resurrection is actually true. Every time you look at this, this picture has a very strong visceral impact. It's, it has a really strong sensory quality. A very similar thing happens if you look at Lucia Fontana's cut canvases. Okay, It almost feels like having a paper cut. Okay. Uh, Every time I look at them, the feeling is still there. It never really subsides for me, okay? Very strong sensory component, okay? A very similar thing with this beautiful sculpture by Michelangelo. You can sort of feel the weight of what he's carrying, okay? So again, a very strong sensation that is coupled with the visual stimulus, okay? Now, um, why is it that you feel this way? So um, David Friedberg and Galesi have this really strong thesis that a very important, essentially what they argue is a prerequisite for really getting something out of artwork is to go through an empathic experience with the art. Okay, In other words, you look at the artwork and the content is able to move you in an empathic way. But how would it be able to move you? You, have a, you need a mechanism that can actually account for that. And the mechanism that they use for actually accounting for this particular phenomenon of empathy is what we know happens in the brain in terms of the mirror neurons. Okay, So mirror neurons were first discovered in primates. They've since been discovered in humans. As you can see, they overlap with the motor parietal pathway in the brain. And this is that remarkable finding that showed that regions of the brain that are activated when a person actually engages or executes a motor act are by and large the same as when a person views the execution of the act. Okay, so in other words, if I hold the cup in front of you and your task is to actually reach for the cup and grab it, this activates the motor and parietal pathways in the brain. But if I show you an image or a film of that happening, they activate by and large the same areas. And these areas are what we talk about in terms of mirror neurons. They're mirroring what's happening. So Friedberg and Galesi have argued that this mirroring mechanism is the neurophysiological mechanism that allows a person to experience empathy, not just in terms of art, but also when they're looking at artwork. So for example, when you look at those uh, Lucia Fontana's cut canvases, for example, that feeling that I described where I kind of feel like I'm, I have a paper cut, is this mirror neuron allowing me to experience that by empathizing with the percept that I'm looking at? Okay, but it's not only limited to what I've shown you so far. So people who like Van Gogh's painting, so one of the most beautiful aspects of Van Gogh's painting is you have a lot of implied motion in the work. Okay, so remember, it's not actual motion, it's implied motion. So there's a really nice study that was published a few years ago in the journal Neuro Report, where people were shown pictures of Van Gogh's paintings in the fMRI scanner, and their task was to basically uh, rate them on aesthetic preference. And what they found is that regions of the brain that are sensitive to movement are activated as a function of how much movement is implied in the paintings that people are looking at. Okay, In other words, it doesn't have to be actual movement in the painting for these regions of the brain to respond. Even implied movement is sufficient for doing that, okay, which is remarkable. Now, interestingly, 
uh, in the image that you see down here for preference, regions of the brain that were involved in computing preference for these images were not the same regions. So those are in the prefrontal cortex. In other words, you've got regions of the brain that are sensitive to implied motion, and the regions of the brain that are sensitive to how much a person actually has a preference for a particular image, they're very similar time courses. So the authors argued that it's really the combination of detecting movement and your aesthetic preference that derives judgment. Another very interesting study that was done by Zaira Cataneo and colleagues is they showed people images, again, they were either representational or abstract, half of which had implied motion, the other half didn't. But they used this very cool method called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, whereby what you can do is you can disturb activity in a brain region temporarily to see whether this might have an impact on judgment. It's a very interesting method to use coupled with fMRI, because as I mentioned to you before, fMRI is completely correlational. TMS actually allows you to bring about a causal disturbance and see its effect. And they were able to show that when you disturb regions of the brain that are computing implied motion, preference for abstract works of art drops, the ones that are actually generating an implied motion effect. Okay, So this is very strong argument in favor of the particular regions of the brain that are sensitive to implied motion playing a causal role in actual aesthetic preferences for those paintings. The same kind of effect was not seen for representational works. And their argument was that in representational work, you already have a lot of content that dictates preference levels. And there, you have more robustness of judgment that is not as sensitive to disturbance by TMS. Okay, this one is a wonderful study that came out a few years ago. So, you know, pointillist paintings, you know, you can look at Sora, everyone knows these beautiful works that are done that require very careful brushwork. Okay, so in this particular study that uh, I highly recommend this study also, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about today, if you want to, I can send you my presentation. This, this wonderful stuff to read here. So that people go, it, it was a behavioral study, not an fMRI study. So people are looking at pointillist paintings and they have to generate an aesthetic rating for what they're looking at. Except right before they looked at them, they were shown three, one of three different kinds of images. One of them is a hand holding a brush in a very rough stroke. Okay? That's what you see at the, um, at the middle. Okay? It's clearly not the way one would hold the brush when you're trying to generate a pointless painting. Okay? Then at the uppermost image up there is exactly how you'd expect the person to hold a brush as they're doing very detailed work that would need to be done when a person is trying to generate a pointillist painting. Okay, at the very bottom, you see the control condition where it's just a gloved hand. Okay, and they were able to show that when people are looking at these images and are generating an aesthetic response for how much they like it, if it's preceded by the brush that's held the right way, their aesthetic ratings are higher. Okay, so what does that tell you? That tells you that there is some kind of an empathic response going on when you're primed by a particular brush stroke. And if there's congruency between the holding of the brush and the kind of artwork that you're looking at, you're more likely to find it aesthetically pleasing. All right? Okay. So um, I hope that I've made the argument here that sensation and perception are both very important. I don't want to make the very strong argument which I've listed up there, which was made by Friedberg and Galesi, who have argued that the empathic response along the lines that I've talked about already are necessary okay, for having a full-fledged aesthetic experience. I think there are probably plenty of examples now, uh, research-wise, that we've shown that Clearly, there are specific kinds of artworks in which empathy of this kind has a very important role to play. And if it's not there, your aesthetic experiences will be depleted. But there are lots of other artistic categories for which this may not necessarily be a prerequisite. But it's important to just remember that there's a large amount of data now to show that your empathic responses and your sensory motor engagement with an artwork can actually impact preference levels. As I said before, I'm clearly running a little late. I hope it's fine. I don't see anybody leaving just yet. You might just be trapped here with me for a while. Um, I'll probably try and go through this a little bit faster. So this one has to do with the knowledge meaning system. So remember, I've talked about two systems. Or the third one, this one is probably the most interesting one. 
it has to do with all kinds of contextual and cultural factors that come into play to impact your preference level. So this is a really nice study that was done a couple of years ago um, where they had people in, in the fMRI scanner. They were shown self-portraits of Rembrandt. Um, they were told that some of them are fakes and some of them are works by the actual master. And the idea was to see whether showing a piece of work to a person and tagging it as a fake work has an impact on preference level and brain function. And what they were able to find is that when you're comparing fake paintings, at least what's supposed, supposedly fake from the perspective of the viewer to what are supposed to be actual authentic works of art, you have increased activation in um, regions of the brain that encode reward, but also the precuneus. Precuneus has a very important role to play in memory, also has a really important role to play in consciousness. Okay, so the idea here being that when people are looking at a work of art, it's not just the stimulus features of the artwork that are important, but the context within which the art is viewed can also impact preference levels. Okay, this one is another wonderful study that was done in Denmark, uh, where people went into the fMRI scanner, uh, they were shown different kinds of images. So if, if for anyone who's been to Denmark, there's a beautiful um, um, gallery just outside of Copenhagen called Louisiana, where they have a beautiful storehouse of wonderful, wonderful artwork. So people went into the fMRI scanner, again, they were shown different kinds of images uh, that were either sourced from Louisiana, and this is what they were told um, in terms of, you know, uh, in, this is what the subjects were told in the fMRI scanner, or they were computer generated. An important thing to remember is that from a perceptual perspective, all the images are the same, but it's the way in which they're introduced to the person. You're creating a context effect. So you're saying, this one is from a proper museum, this one is computer generated. They were able to show that when the same image is considered to be computer generated, there's a significant drop in liking for it. Okay. More importantly, when people tend to look at a painting that is, that is supposedly from a museum, the regions of the brain that are encoding reward, especially the orbital frontal cortex, is significantly more activated. Okay. So again, it's not just what you're looking at that matters, but the contextual environment within which the work is produced can actually impact judgment. Okay, this is another study that was done. Uh, this was a very interesting study because people went to the fMRI scanner. Again, they were shown different kinds of images. You can see pairs of images. In every pair, one image is a proper work of art. Okay, in the other one, it's compositionally and content-wise the same, but it's clearly not a work of art. And the um, authors were able to show that when people are looking at these images, you see significant differences in the brain's uh, uh, system that encodes um, reward okay so regions of the brain that are encoding reward are actually activated significantly more when people are looking at something that's supposedly an actual work of art as opposed to something that's compositionally and content-wise similar but not a work of art okay so to sum up uh, it looks like aesthetic experiences emerge out of the interaction of three large scale systems in the brain. There is the reward emotion valuation system, there's a sensory motor system, and there's a knowledge meaning system. Not all of them have to be activated all the time for aesthetic judgments to emerge, but almost always there's interaction between at least a couple of these systems. Okay, It's a very flexible system. Uh, in some cases, a particular system will take over more than the others, but all of these factors come into play to impact what you find aesthetically pleasing. Now, how about moving beyond this, okay? So uh, about 20 or 25 years ago, when a lot of this work was really starting, we were really focused on specific structures in the brain. But now we no longer look at structures, we look at large scale systems in the brain. And these are groups of neurons that tend to be co-activated at the same time when the person is doing something similar. And one of the major systems in the brain that's gained huge amounts of attention recently is the default mode network. You may have heard about this already because it's discussed in the popular media quite often. So the default mode network is the network that typically comes online when you're not dealing with external stimuli. Okay, so right now, it's probably deactivated in almost all of you if you're paying any kind of attention to me. Okay, but it comes online uh, due to what I refer to as internally generated thoughts. So when you're, when you're mind wandering, when you're daydreaming, the default mode network is significantly more activated. Okay, so 
what happens when people look at paintings, interestingly, has also been shown to engage the default mode network. And this network, not only is it engaged for internally generated thoughts having to do with things like mind wandering and daydreaming, but it's also very heavily engaged when a person is thinking about self-relevant information. So any kind of priming that gets the person thinking about themselves gets to engage the default mode network. So Ed Vessel, whom I've talked about before already when I talked about the individual differences study, did a very nice study where people went into the fMRI scanner, they were shown different kinds of artworks. Again, he had them rate these artworks on how moving uh, they were found to be. And he found that in cases where you find the artwork to be most moving. So if you're looking at the right Likert scale going from one to four, when you're generating ratings of four, the default mode network tends to be significantly more activated than not, okay? So the idea here being that even though you're giving people a very small window of time to engage with the stimuli, and you're not necessarily priming them to think about self-relevant information, when people are engaging with artworks, these kinds of information do come online and they can impact people's aesthetic judgments, okay? So he has a very interesting model that he's proposed recently where you essentially have these two different kinds of orientation. So on the one hand, you've got what's referred to as external orientation. So here, your job is essentially perception. And what you can see is you've, you see that really big purple blob there, which is the visual cortex, because what you're dealing with at that particular moment is you're processing external information coming from the visual channel. And then what you've got in the middle there is internally oriented thought that's typically not activated when you're looking at something in the outside world, okay? It usually comes online when you're engaged in internal mentation. So interestingly, when people are dealing with artworks, we're seeing a co-activation of regions that are externally and internally oriented. And he sort of made this argument that it is true that it's probably difficult to argue that artworks are a, spe a special category of objects, but it could be that aesthetic interactions are one of those unique cases where both the external and internal orientation come online together to generate a full-fledged aesthetic experience. So conclusions, uh, the common currency hypothesis, which I've already mentioned before, very important to remember that our aesthetic experiences are very heavily influenced by context and individual differences. In all of our studies, we see loads and loads of differences in judgment, loads and loads of differences in terms of the specific brain regions that are, that are coming online. There is clearly regularity because we're seeing really interesting consistency across studies, but nevertheless, import, it's important not to forget all of those larger contextual factors within which all of this is happening. Okay. Now, in terms of major outstanding questions, uh, this could have been like an entire book, okay, but, I, but I've limited myself to three, okay. The first one is, um, we know that almost everything that I've talked about so far has to do with kind of like pleasurable experiences, but we know that a lot of interactions with artwork engage emotions that we typically think of as negative, so fear and anger and so forth. We know very little right now about the extent to which those specific kinds of emotion categories and emotion types come into play during aesthetic experiences. I think it's a major open question. It's one of those low-hanging fruits in the sense that the technology is now available to kind of move away from simple pleasures to look at some of these really interesting, more complex phenomena. The second one, which is something that comes up over and over again, especially depending on the kind of audience that I'm giving a talk to, about whether one can look at artworks as a special category of stimuli. Okay, so my feeling about this question is that, by and large, the answer is no. I think there are all kinds of social, cultural, and contextual factors that embed the experience of art as you're interacting with artworks that kind of give it that special flavor. But I know that there are still a lot of people that argue quite strongly that there's something really special about art objects per se as a category of class of stimuli. And that's, that to me is another very interesting open question. And a final thing that I want to touch on, because if you have any kind of interest in this area of research, especially in social psychology, it's a big area of study, is whether there's any kind of correspondence between 
beauty and other kinds of um, evaluations that we do in terms of morality. Okay, so for example, we know we know that people assign all kinds of characteristics to beautiful faces about which they have no information. Okay, so uh, people tend to think that um, more beautiful people are smarter, they tend to think of them as morally better, all kinds of things about which no information is presented. You can sort of imagine how much of an impact this would have in your day to day functioning within the social world, in which you're making these judgments very, very quickly, implicitly, and you're probably not even aware of them. Now, there is some really interesting work happening right now trying to see the extent to which these very interesting kinds of judgments like beauty and morality kind of overlap and the extent to which it might be possible to make people more aware of these things because they're clearly opportunities there for biased judgment as a result of the improper signal. So that I think is another very interesting area of study with some clearly um, up for grabs practical applications. And on that note, I'll end this presentation. Thank you very much. No, I thought it was a no. <laughs> so I'm going to stand here for a minute to see whether there's another microphone that uh, is going to give, uh, I'm not sure if the channel's turned on at the back, but the, um, the light is clearly on. So thanks, Kanika, for troubleshooting there. So uh, we're going to come around with the test. And once you've filled that in, then you can ask a question. So I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. But uh, uh, I'm going to be working with Kate at the back uh, because we have been streaming tonight's presentation. And so um, we know that there's going to be some questions that are coming in online. But I'm here to field and moderate questions from the floor. So although I haven't got the uh, uh, microphone to walk around with you yet and make sure that you're amplified and can be heard, I am going to step out of the light and uh, see if there's a first question from the floor here. And uh, I will repeat the question or paraphrase it uh, using the microphone here to make sure that everyone can, uh, can hear that question. Test one, two. Can we hear? Any questions in the floor? Just stay away. Test, testing? We got it. OK, here we are. That's great. Thank you very much, Kate. Okay, Wonderful. You. Oh, you got a mic too. That's really I've got clever. A mic too. All That's right, right, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for a very informative talk. And I know you can't cover everything, but I was just curious about the people you have viewing in terms of their characteristics. In your research, do you, you know, gender, uh, other age, et cetera, background? Does that matter? Oh, that's actually an excellent question. Um, so uh, for most of the studies that we typically do with fMRI, we have some demographic information that we uh, collect. So we typically would have uh, information about gender, we have uh, participants' age. One thing that we always look at very, very closely is formal training in the arts. That could be a whole different lecture if I'm invited back, okay? So uh, in empirical aesthetics, probably one of the most robust phenomena that we know of is the impact that formal training in art has in the way people perceive things. And the effects are very strong and profound. Um, um, what Karen and I were talking about this last night, for example, so to give, it, to give you a flavor of how this research looks like, for example. So um, for people who've got no training in the visual arts, say I present you with a particular painting and I collect a beauty rating from you. Okay, so you can, for example, rate this painting going on a scale of say one to seven. And then what I typically will do in our lab is we uh, grayscale the painting, remove all the color information and collect a second preference rating. So what you tend to see in people with no training in art is that there's a significant drop in their preference level when, the, when that color information is removed. Kind of suggesting that a lot of the preference is kind of driven in some ways by the superficial perceptual features of the artwork that they're looking at. Now in people with a proper formal training in visual art, uh, when you collect ratings, with the stimuli in color versus no color, there's almost no difference in preference level. And the idea there is that with a person with formal training in visual art, who's been kind of trained to look at paintings in a specific way, is looking at the geometric structure 
and the underpinning of the work of art, which of course is unaffected when you remove color information. So that kind of information is very important to keep in mind when you're analyzing data in the absence of which it becomes very difficult to interpret. But one kind of information which we've historically not been very good at collecting are different kinds of socio-demographic and cultural factors. So I talked about the knowledge meaning system. We now know that these factors play a massive, massive role. Um, this last year, we put together the handbook for um, empirical aesthetics with this really good friend of mine, Marcos Nadal, who knows way more about this stuff than I do, actually. And uh, we had some really good chapters in there looking at specifically those kinds of factors that drive preference levels. So my hope is that as we go forward in this area, and we need these questions to improve our methods that we develop better ways to look at some of these kind of larger social cultural factors and we're able to account for them from a neurological perspective great answer thank you very much so the next question is going to come from our online audience over to you kate yes yeah, so a fantastic presentation is there any research on how when we come to like someone we begin to grow a liking to their looks example they become increasingly good looking even if it's even if this did not occur initially. Uh, so so that, that's a very interesting phenomenon. That, that one probably has less to do with um, uh, some of the factors that I've talked about today, but probably has to do with various kinds of familiarity factors coming into play, which might modulate your preference levels. But what we do know from this work that I've talked about so far are a couple of things that are related, okay? So one of them is that when we present people with uh, pictures of faces, which vary in attractiveness, and um, so in a lot, a lot of our uh, studies, we allow the people to look at the faces for as long as they wish before they make a preference judgment. So we know that uh, faces that are more beautiful are viewed longer before the person generates a preference rating because you're trying to expose yourself to them for longer periods of time, okay? And there's, there's actually an even more interesting study that was done a few years ago where uh, people went into the scan. I don't, think, I don't think it was an fMRI, I think it was a PET scanner. And the idea behind that particular study was that you would see images of faces that you were supposed to rate on attractiveness, but you could determine how long you wanted to look at those faces by pressing a button. Okay, so it was really, are you going to work hard to extend exposure to a face that you find beautiful? So it's a very reliable effect that you get with heterosexual males looking at pictures of females. Okay, so uh, when a female face is perceived to be more attractive, the male will work, actually work much, much harder uh, that you can measure very robustly using a button press uh, to extend exposure periods. So it could very well be that in your actual interpersonal interactions, as those, as those periods of exposure become longer, all kinds of familiarity factor, uh, factors come into play, which can then end up modulating your preference judgments over time. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ocean. So second question coming from the back here now. Hi, uh, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, is there any, are you or is there anyone in your field doing uh, or studying neuroaesthetics in um, ch uh, childhood, infancy, childhood, and adolescence when you're showing the slides on, you know, the, the insula or the putamen or what have you? My, one of my first thoughts was like, well, at what age does that start happening when people look at, at beautiful images? So I was wondering if there's, there's kind of work on this in children. Okay, so, so I'm so happy you asked that question. Uh, the answer, is no, and I think it's a, and I think and 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 it's not because we don't want to. Um, it's I've been trying to work with a few people going back at least three three to five years, trying to come up with some kind of a paradigm that would work with children, and also coming up with some kind of a setup where we can actually collect these kinds of data from children. So we know very little right now about the developmental trajectory of when these um, preference systems come into play, like you see them in adults. Uh, I know that it's a major open question. I know that a lot of studies have been done, not necessarily looking at paintings, um, but for example, looking at objects and faces in infants that are very, very young. But I think to do the kinds of studies that you suggest, you kind of need to have kind of a longitudinal test, retest sort of setup, where you can kind of see where the specific kinds of capacities and abilities develop over time. And unfortunately, nothing of that kind has been done yet. We have some cross-sectional studies where we have collected preference, not me personally, but data have been collected from faces and artworks and objects from infants that are very, very young. But it doesn't give you the kind of clout that you need 
empirically to kind of make a strong argument about the developmental trajectory. For example, um, uh, I always tell my friends, uh, one of the nicest areas you can compare this to is there's some really, really great research done in the developmental trajectory of the uh, development of intelligence over time. Okay, so there's been some really, really great work done using brain imaging technologies where people have looked at cortical thickness in the course of development while measuring a person's IQ over time. And then you can look at the correlation between how the cortical thickness and the structure of the brain changes over time and a person's adult IQ level. Uh, nothing of this kind exists in empirical aesthetics, but I'm really, really hoping that someone's going to do it. Hopefully in collaboration with me. That's a great answer and a good corollary to the first question about the demographics, because I know that also involved age. So thank you very much. So uh, Kate, let's have a question from the online audience again. Of course, please. yeah. So um, our next question is, what do you think the importance of studying neuroaesthetics is in our society? And what kind of applications does your work process? Possess, sorry, possess. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's uh, that's also a very good question. So one of the one of the things I really like about this area of work, um, if you remember earlier, I talked about how um, aesthetic experiences extend far beyond art. It is really true that a lot of us who do work in this area, we tend to really focus on art. But my primary area of research probably going back from uh, to the last maybe five to 10 years is, for example, our aesthetic experiences that we have for different kinds of architectural design features. So I do loads of work with architects and designers all over the world. And we know that there are all kinds of architectural design features which impact your aesthetic judgments of spaces. So one thing that I really love about this room is how curved this space is. So we've been doing a lot of work on, for example, the impact of curvature in the architecture and how this impacts people's preference levels. So we know that everything else being equal, this has been shown several, several times to be true, that when people are in a space that, that is curved, they tend to prefer it much more than when they're in a space that is not curved, okay? So uh, this has been shown to be true for airport design. We've done studies showing it to be true for interior architecture, and many others have replicated that as well. And then we did an fMRI study a few years ago in Spain to try and see which regions of the brain are activated more when you're finding beauty in curved spaces. And uh, the region of the brain that we found, the anterior cingulate cortex, falls within the emotion pathways of the brain. So it looks like something about affective processes comes into play that drives your increased preference for curved spaces. So this work has very direct applications. You know, we don't only study curvature. We, for example, look at things like ceiling height. So people tend to prefer rooms with higher ceilings. They tend to feel better in them. We know that higher ceilings promote abstract thinking over concrete thinking. So you can kind of use that to, for example, modify classroom environments, depending on what kind of thinking you're trying to instill. So right now I'm working with a university in Italy that has a really big program for training architects and designers. And as part of the program of becoming an architecture major in that university at the master's level, they now have classes in evidence-based neuroscience and psychology of design. And the idea there being that you're going to have people who are going to go out there and they're going to be um, providing designs for different kinds of places for people to work and live in. Wouldn't it be nice if to optimize living and working in those spaces, you had um, evidential data from fields like aesthetics to drive your design uh, modules. So that's, for example, one basic area where I think there's a lot of applied significance. Another thing that I think, another area that I think is very, very ripe for further research is what I talked about before, which has to do with this overlap between facial attractiveness and all kinds of other socially relevant judgments that we make for which people have no information but make automatic inferences about. Okay, so this really good colleague of mine, Anjan Chatterjee, who's a wonderful researcher who runs, who's a director of the neuroscience um, uh, center at, uh, at Penn, he has a huge area of research right now on uh, facial disfigurement and how that's used to um, propel different kinds of stereotypes in, in culture, in movies, and so forth, and the extent to which people infer all kinds of things about disfigurement, which has really nothing to do with the information provided to the person. So I think from an applied perspective, there's a lot of educational opportunities there. Another area where I think there's loads and loads of opportunity that this work could contribute to is in economic decision making. So um, one of the nicest areas in um, uh, behavioral economics is the kinds of factors that drive, for example, a person's 
purchasing behavior. So uh, in a lot of these studies, the person goes into the fMRI scanner, they're shown a picture of an object, okay, in a passive state. So when the person is looking at this particular object, you can measure the signal in regions of the brain that are encoding how rewarding they find this object to be. Then the person is asked to make a purchase decision in case in terms of whether they actually want to pay to purchase that object or not. So we now know that the extent to which reward patterns, patterns of the brain are engaged that can predict whether you decide whether you want to buy that object or not. I am pretty sure that aesthetic judgments would have a very similar trajectory. Okay, in other words, your aesthetic assessment of an object that you're looking at probably is going to engage the same reward systems that could then in turn um, determine purchasing behavior. So in something like the economic domain, another area that I think is ripe for further exploration. I think Big Brother just entered the room. So we're, uh, we're about halfway through the, uh, the Q&A section now, and I am spotting, I've got two more people in the room here, but what you've got to do is catch my question. Uh, now I've got three, there we go. Thank you for the presentation again, it was marvelous. When you study uh, art history, often the first thing you get to is Greek and Roman architecture. And they tell you that the, one of the reasons you like it so much is because it's human scale and that the curvature of things relates to the human form. Do you have any comments about that? Wow, so many good questions. Yeah, so, um, so the work that I do in architecture and design so we have a team, uh, so it consists of kind of uh, some, some of them are people like me. So they're psychologists, neuroscientists, but we also work very closely with actual uh, architects and designers. So a lot of them pointed us to these really classical writings in architecture that emphasized uh, so this idea of the human scale and also uh, proportionality. Because a lot of the features that we were looking at, so I was looking at the features in isolation. So ceiling height, curvature, the extent to which the room feels open versus enclosed. But they really try to uh, educate me that according to classical rules of architecture, it's really the proportions that really matter and the extent to which at a human level, the person can see themselves operating in this environment. We haven't experimentally manipulated that. So the work right now is very much in its infancy. So we looked at the effects of these kind of isolated features. And um, most of the work that we do shows people um, um, images of room interiors. By the way, if anybody wants any of this stimuli, you can just contact me. I'm very happy to share them. So these are images of room interiors that vary in all of these dimensions. But some of the nicest work that's happening right now, uh, also again being partly done in Denmark, but not only there, is coupling people with um, mobile technology devices and virtual reality, which allows them to actually navigate in a space. Okay. So in our studies, the person goes into the fMRI scanner, I show them an image of, say, curved space, and I collect brain activity data. In these more modern studies that have been done in, um, at least there's a few of them that came, uh, that came out uh, last few years out of Denmark, the person will be um, paired with a portable EEG device, and they have a virtual reality set of goggles, so they can envision the space in three dimensions and actually navigate through them. And I think now that we have these, um, technologies available, we can address what you brought up, which is kind of modulating things like human scale versus not, and seeing whether this, for example, can impact their decision to enter or exit the space or how much they end up liking that space. That's wonderful, thanks. So over to Kate for the next uh, question from our online audience. Okay, this please. one's kind of a two part question. And then I think after this, I'll close the online engagement questions. Um, but it says, thanks for your talk and your deep work you've done. Is it possible to create a model that is a quartet rather than a triad? How can you address the nuances that result from the experience of an actual work of art rather than an image of a work of art? Picasso famously said, I don't paint vases, I paint paintings. If we are able to talk, about full-fledged aesthetic experience, please consider the primacy of the actual artifact. Well, that's a, that's a really profound question. I, um, uh, I certainly am not um, opposed to revising a model. So uh, the, the model that we have so far is, I think it's a tree, it's a, a tripartite model, mostly because it's based on the data that we have so far. And I think the data that we have so far 
is in term is in many ways limited by the experimental designs that we've used so far. But uh, something along the lines that was suggested, which has to do with the primacy of the actual work versus a 2D representation of that work, uh, th that's a very legitimate point. Unfortunately, um, I don't have empirical data to address it, but it's entirely possible that dealing with an actual object in real three-dimensional space might bring about different kinds of aesthetic experiences and might activate different kinds of brain pathways than looking at a 2D uh, representation. Great answer, thank you. Uh, yeah, I can, um, uh, just to elaborate on that for a minute, uh, <laughs> because I'm prone to doing that. Uh, a very similar thing has, has happened to the work in architecture and design. So as I was discussing with this gentleman here earlier, so a lot of the work earlier was done using two-dimensional images, but now that we're doing three-dimensional mobile technologies, our data are different. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that navigating in real space, which is three-dimensional, is just different than looking at a two-dimensional image of that space. So it could very well be that a similar principle applies to the artworks that I've discussed so far. Nice corollary. Thanks, Oshin. We have another question from the floor here. Thank you, Doctor, for your wonderful talk. Um, I had a question specifically on empathy. Uh, obviously, that plays a really big part on art um, aesthetic appreciation, as you've been talking about. My question is, is is that empathy seen more in the when someone's experiencing the art versus like the actual empathy of the subject matter or is it the empathy of the artist who's created the art like i'm just trying to imagine that people who are not empathetic would they be the people who really are not art appreciators or not appreciators of beauty and aesthetics that's another really good question. Okay, so I'm going to have to unpack this question because there's I, I, I kind of heard two different questions there. So, uh, so one of them has to do with um, essentially the transference of the empathy from the creator to the perceiver, correct? I thought that was part of the question. So um, uh, that's, that's a very interesting thing. And, you know, unfortunately, people who do work on artistic creativity are really disjointed from people who do work on aesthetic appreciation. So most of this work doesn't really combine these two parts together. But uh, a really good friend of mine, uh, Pablo Tinio, has this really beautiful model that he introduced a few years ago called the mirror model of art. Okay, And I just have to talk about this model because um, I've told him I've, I find this to be such a wonderful model. So uh, what he essentially tried to do is he tried to link what's happening in the brain of the creator to what's happening in the brain of the perceiver. Okay, Not only brain, but of course the mind. And the idea that he proposed is that uh, so when you're creating a work of art, you kind of go through a three-part uh, system. So in the first part, you kind of have an idea or a concept in your mind that drives the creation of the work. So any artist that you've talked to, there's been a ton of historiometric analysis of this data, typically will start with some kind of an idea or um, uh, concept they try to put forth. And that could be, for example, heavily influenced by the empathy of the creator. Okay, And then they go through an intermediary stage where the geometric framework of the work is put in place, the underwriting goes in, and the third part of the completion of the artwork is finishing all the detail and finishing the superficial features of the artwork before it is presented to the perceiver. So you go from conceptualization to underwriting to completion. Now, interestingly, when the viewer interacts with the artwork, they travel in the opposite direction. So when you first look at a work of art, you are typically processing all of its quote unquote superficial sensory perceptual features up front. Then you can decode further content geometric features within the artwork. And if you're very successful, you can go all the way and grasp something about the initial concept or the idea of the creator that motivated the work. And this is a really wonderful way to look at the back and forth between artistic creation and aesthetic appreciation, because the work of art becomes a medium to transfer meaning and information to the perceiver. So when a creator is, creator is creating a work of art, it's not created in a vacuum, there's an intended audience in mind. And it could be that the concept or the idea that you're trying to communicate is in fact empathy, okay? And what you're really hoping is that by the time the work of art is completely finished, that the person traversing in the other direction can make conceptual contact with that idea, okay? 
I love this model. It's called the mirror model of art. Um, it, it was published in 2013 in this journal called Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity, and the Art. I, I highly recommend you look at this paper. It's not a long paper, but it's a, it's a deep paper. So that's part of the answer to your question. The other half of it, which I think uh, you refer to, has to do with kind of individual differences in a person's general empathy level when they're interacting with an artwork. So there's something to be said about empathy in terms of mirror neurons, which is kind of like decoding from a sensory perspective what that work is trying to touch from a sensorial perspective. But of course, we also know that there are individual differences in how empathic people can be. We have lots of scales in psychology that measure that. To the best of my knowledge, I don't know of any study that has looked at uh, individual differences in empathy and the extent to which this allows depth of aesthetic experience. But I think that could be a fabulous study to do. Somebody better run with it. <laughs> okay, so um, we're getting close towards the end of our Q&A period. I got to watch my own moderator at the back here, but uh, um, I know there's at least two or three more questions in the room. And if we don't get to all of them, um, I know that Ocean has said that he's, uh, you know, going to be around afterwards, and he's also welcome to uh, have people contact him directly to get the, uh, the answers that they might be seeking. Uh, yes, thank you for... Uh... Uh, the very good presentation and uh, um, I uh, have a question that is being probably answered uh, partially here. Uh, I wanted to make uh, sure how, uh, first of all, why you choose this method of F, uh, MRI and how is it different from MRI, what shows you different things. And, uh, and the other thing is uh, here, uh, uh, which also has been addressed a little bit. Uh, how do you actually show these uh, people the images? They are looking, they are, have their head into this uh, device and how do you show them this? And uh, if there is a possibility to show them uh, more uh, or a different, uh, in a different way. Oh yeah, so, so those are very good technical questions. So um, the reason why I, use, uh, why I opted to use um, fMRI for doing these studies essentially has to do with two features of fMRI, which are its uh, um, uh, spatial and temporal resolution. So one thing that fMRI is really, really good for is localizing specific areas within the brain where activity is happening. So in terms of spatial localization, it's a very, very good method. One thing that it's not really great for is its temporal resolution. And what I mean by that is fMRI is really good for capturing different kinds of cognitive phenomena that are unfolding in the order of several seconds. Okay, so for example, if, you, um, if your area of study was you know, stereotypes and you were really, really interested in very rapid events in the brain that are happening in the order of a few milliseconds, fMRI is now very good because this really allows you to look at things that unfold in the order of several seconds. It was really good for aesthetic um, experience because we know that aesthetic episodes take a bit of time to unfold. So the classic model in this area that was introduced by Helmut Lader, which is still uh, very prevalent and influential, has a person going through a sequence of events when they're looking at an artwork. So when you first look at the artwork, you've got the sensory perceptual events that take hold. After you've dealt with those, all of the automatic memory effects kick in, familiarity, for example, with the content of the painting. Then you have all kinds of explicit categorization events that come into play. If you, for example, have formal training, you classify the work in terms of what epoch it's from. Then eventually the most important part kicks in, which is cognitive mastery, which is what I was trying to look get at when I was talking about the mirror model of art, which is ultimately what you're trying to get out of art is you're trying to extract meaning, okay? And if you cannot make sense of what it is that you're looking at, there's usually a huge drop in preference levels. And all of these things happening over time will unfold over a few seconds, and fMRI is really, really good for capturing that. So. Uh, it's really a combination of the spatial and temporal resolution. Now, in the fMRI scanner, it's, it is a bit of an unusual environment to be looking at art because the person is lying supine. They're on their back, and we have a mirror, an inverted mirror, that's placed in front of the person's visual field, where the image will appear 
essentially directly in front of them. What you can do in the fMRI these days is some really exciting things. So we can show images, we can show movies. I have a really wonderful thing that I purchased a few years ago um, that was developed at U of T, which is what's called an MRI compatible tablet. So you can take this tablet into the fMRI scanner and for example, the person can draw inside the scanner. So you can do really cool studies on creative drawing. The person can write. So now we have these beautiful studies. Uh, we, ha we haven't done um, a work on literature in our lab because literature is not my area. But I know that some really good work has been done in people actually composing poetry and literature uh, in the fMRI scanner. So I would say that now compared to about 15 or 20 years ago, we can do much more uh, with the fMRI setup. We were very, very limited. Uh, 20 years ago, we had to do some like very structured and constrained designs, but now there's a lot of uh, possibility. For example, some of the really nice studies I unfortunately didn't have time to talk about today have to do with, for example, jazz improvisation. So now you can get MRI compatible keyboards, so you can have people who are fluent in jazz improvisation actually improvise in the fMRI scanner, which is super amazing. So I think as time goes by, we'll probably have more and more uh, kit like this to play with. Um, it is a constrained environment. You can't do everything, uh, but I think over time we're getting to do more and more. Wonderful. Um, we do have, I'm told, time for one last question. So apologies to at least one person I know that had uh, lined up, but uh, um, other people can approach me if it's busy afterwards. I'm sure our speaker will be mobbed uh, and there is a reception. The galleries will be open for a while, but let's just get to this last question first. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your work and knowledge. You mentioned the importance of contextual factors, so culture, demographics. I'm wondering if you can comment on or have looked at other psychosocial factors, so how much someone values art in their evaluation of aesthetic. And similar to eye tracking studies where you look at how much someone um, has satisfaction or commitment in their relationship and then won't notice attractive alternatives if those type of factors might play a role as well. Oh yeah, so so uh, the, again, a, a couple of very good questions there. So in terms of eye tracking, so uh, the eye tracking work that I know of so far in this area hasn't been done inside the fMRI scanner. So I know that some really good eye tracking work has been done primarily. So one of the people who's done some of the best work in this area, his name is Paul Locker. So um, he's um, from Montclair University. So he has done some really, really great work uh, with eye tracking um, having to do with um, how, experts versus non-experts look at visual art. Okay? So there's a very famous uh, theorist in our field called Arnheim, and he kind of made this strong argument that when people are creating artworks, so when the artist is creating artwork, they have a particular way in which they place different kinds of objects within the canvas. So for example, could be a still life on which you put different kinds of objects where you locate the people, like animals in the field and so forth and so on. And that each of these things are given a particular weight in the artwork. So not that this weight is explicitly told to the viewer, but they have weight and the artist will try and balance them in certain ways. So uh, Paul Locker had done some very nice studies to show that when people who've got no training in visual art are looking at um, artworks, they probably will be drawn to a couple of important salient features of the artwork, but they don't really scan it in its entirety. But that people who have um, expertise in art, they are really, really good at decoding what those particular features are within the artwork that carry weight. Okay? So they have a better sense of the geometric properties of that work. I don't know if eye tracking, eye, eye tracking work has been done with um, fMRI scanner. I don't I have a portable eye tracker in our lab, but we haven't found a way to make it work in the scanner because of the magnetic properties. But I think it's one of those things where I think it's probably going to happen at some point. But the eye tracking data are very, very useful. Um, now, in terms of the other contextual factors, there is basically a very large number that one could look at. Um, the, what we've considered so far is a very, very small um, subsample of what's possible. But I, I welcome you and anyone else here who has kind of good ideas for specific kinds of contextual factors to include, like the one that you suggested. If, um, if people email me, I, it, it's very useful for me. I'll, I'll for sure get back to you about it. And it will kind of help me think about what we should consider in the future for these studies. Very generous. So um, 
to draw to a close and give some final remarks and, uh, and formal thanks to our speakers, I'd like to uh, invite Ken Bradley up to the stage and um, I'd like to have a round of applause again for Ken, but also for uh, uh, all our questions tonight and the people that uh, shared their thoughts. I, I wanted to thank everyone who came. I'm really overwhelmed by the level of interest in this talk, and I really appreciate the fact that you came. This also includes everyone who tuned in online. So thank you for coming, and I'm very grateful. I'm almost afraid to speak uh, for fear of being psychoanalyzed. <laughs> For those of you in the room who know me, you already know I'm odd, so it can't get much worse. Uh, I've waited a long time to. Okay, okay. I, I've waited a long time to uh, hear this presentation, and uh, I'm just uh, so delighted uh, with what I heard tonight. And I have many questions I do want to ask, and uh, will ask outside. Uh, I think it's uh, particularly uh, relevant, uh, the presentation we heard tonight, uh, standing in this place, uh, being in the space. Uh, this building was an act conceived in celebration and it was born with confidence in the future, bold confidence in the future. Built as a planetarium, its purpose was to discover, explore and understand our vast universe through science, learning and education. One can easily, so easily imagine how many minds were open to new possibilities in this room. Science by its very nature relentlessly propels forward through new scientific discoveries, more powerful computing power, next generation equipment, and shiny new facilities. Science knows only the fast forward button. In fast forward mode, this wonderful building became obsolete to its original purpose happily leadership and vision prevailed and this remarkable building found its new purpose a contemporary art museum and in doing so fulfilled a three decades long dream that in darker moments seemed would never happen but it did and we are here tonight the journey of this building has come full circle i think in a wondrous way from a building where light years black holes and celestial planets thrilled to a building dedicated to discovering and celebrating the human condition and its expression through visual arts. Yes, stars in the night sky are truly awesome, but somehow those stars become reachable when seen in Van Gogh's Starry Night or in the Heavenly Bodies paintings by our very own Gathy Flock. That series was painted when she was in her mid 80s. I believe it's because of the human ability artists have to connect us to our shared humanness that we sense the beauty and the relevance in such works, even if unknowingly. Unlike science, art has a pause button and in fact encourages us to use it. This, the interplay between science and art is a recurring theme in the public program series supporting the Everywhere We Are exhibition. On August 26, the program, I Remember the Flood, was held. On this very stage, we heard from six remarkable men and women representing arts organizations in the city of Calgary. All were directly involved in the 2013 flood relief efforts. I say remarkable because that is what they are, individuals and organizations who sprung to action even as the rain kept falling and water levels rose. Mercifully, there were many other like-minded individuals and organizations. And because of their heroic efforts, many thousands of artworks were saved, artists and galleries were helped. I benefited tremendously from their efforts. The city and province benefited. We all did. And I remember the flood we heard about the contribution of science in art, conservation, and restoration. We learned how geotechnical, engineering, and water management sciences are helping to mitigate and hopefully prevent devastation from future flooding. But it takes the genius of an artist to capture both loss and hope in a way that words can never do. In the atrium, there is a work by celebrated Canadian artist Wynne Jalance called Warehouse 1993-2015. Warehouse 1993 was destroyed in the flood. 
The Warehouse in the Atrium is a wonderful new work that acknowledges the shared trauma and memories of the flood and how in the act of sharing, we experience catharsis. When, if you're listening, I hope, uh, I want to again, thank you for creating that uh, work. It's, it, it means so much to me that you did. The Everywhere We Are program series concludes in early 2022 with the presentation Possible Worlds by Dr. Alex Nagel, Professor of Fine Arts at New York University. In this program, we will see a different example of how scientific research and investigation intersect with art. The contributions made by the social sciences, humanities, and classical and ancient studies, the art historians, anthropologists, archaeologists, and the list goes on. Their very important work helps reveal the connections between art and social, economic, religious, and political systems. Art not only helps us to understand those systems, but influences how civilizations and culture change over time. In Possible Worlds, Professor Nagel will examine Parmigianino's Madonna of the Rose, a painting of the Madonna with a child in her arms pointing to a globe. It was painted around 1530, midway through the age of exploration and discovery. Nicholas Copernicus was 57 years of age and his then considered heretical writings challenging the Roman Catholic Church's teachings on creation were in full play. Dr. Nagel had the freedom to choose what he would talk about and chose this specific topic in painting after he heard about this dome. But surely there can be no world to explore more personal or intimate than our brains. That part of ourselves that gives us intellect, emotion, sensory information, our ability to understand the world around us, to grasp the concept of beauty, creation, and most mysteriously of all, that which we call the sacred. What you might not know is that tonight's presentation touches on only a part of Dr. Bartanian's research interests, the brain's response to viewing art. This was an intentional choice because it is in keeping with the focus of Everywhere We Are exhibition, which places the emphasis on the viewer. Equally fascinating and critically important is brain function as it relates to making art. It is my hope, Dr. Vitarian, that your experience here tonight is positive and that we can entice you back so we can hear about your other research. Art is many things. It's because of its ubiquitous nature, we are mesmerized, fascinated, and puzzled. But after years of collecting, I have come to understand that at its core, it is gift-giving. While art itself exists in its own right, that's part of the miracle of creation. Self is given when art is made. Self is given when art is viewed. And was it not Isaac Newton who taught us the law of action and reaction? Dr. Vitanian, your presentation helped me to better understand the reaction part of Sir Isaac's law. I am also certain that tonight you have carried on the great tradition of this room by opening our minds to new possibilities and for that we are all truly grateful. I also would like to end by also acknowledging and thanking uh, others who financially contributed uh, to, this, uh, to this presentation and to the possible worlds that will be held uh, early next year. Um, and I guess really must type thank the University of Calgary leadership for uh, finally uh, understanding the importance of um, opening up giving days uh, to the nickel galleries. And because of that matching program, we were able to raise uh, uh, the monies uh, that have helped support the public programs. But uh, in particular, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Bill and Janice Cooper in North Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Gordon Holden. I would like to thank uh, Eric Axford, Diane and Megan. I think Eric, you're here in the room tonight. I'd also like to uh, thank my uh, good neighbor, Doug, Doug Gray. And uh, I'd like to thank, I would like to um, thank uh, the Larocs in Ottawa, my Bobby, Jay, uh, Kendra, my beautiful goddaughter, uh, and Aiden, uh, who all contributed uh, to, this, um, to, to this program tonight. Thank you. Oh. oh.
sorry, uh, uh, there's also one final thank you. And this thank you actually is really special because I get to actually back it up with something more than just words and uh, sentiment. So uh, Ocean, if you want to come up here, hopefully the gift is right. Uh, and uh, thank you so much.